Jane's career is somewhat unusual. She graduated from the University of York in 1972 in a degree in biochemistry, and then she went on to do a PGCE. And after several years of teaching in secondary school, she came back to do her PhD at the age of 40. And she's achieved a lot since then. So she's served as the deputy head of the Department of Chemistry. Uh, she's also been uh, awarded, presented several awards, including the US Genomics Award for the Biophysical Society in 2010. And she was elected a fellow of Royal Society in 2015. And also she recently received the prestigious Stein and Moore Award in 2016. So apart from the scientific interest, Jane is particularly interested in um, encouraging young women in academia. And we are very interested to hear what she, all the experiences she has to share with us today. And we are honored to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So, so Lisa didn't tell tell you is uh, also I'm her PhD supervisor, so <laughs> you could take all those lovely things she said with, with perhaps a pinch of salt. Thank you, Lisa. So I'm I'm really honoured, and and it's been a great afternoon. I I've never been to a, a, an event like this where it's such a diverse group of speakers, and you really are to be congratulated. I go to an awful lot of conferences and I see slides that are completely useless and talks that run over for hours and that nobody but the person and their friend can understand. So I think you've done a brilliant job and so thank you for inviting me and I've enjoyed this afternoon. So um, here's a I just want to give you a, a sort of brief tour through my career and I hope that um, it's my career in science, but I hope it's of relevance to uh, everybody here because it's sort of sort of looking at the way life and careers start. Now, I'm not a Mac, I'm not a, ah, right. So who am I? Um, I'm Professor of Molecular Biophysics. So get that, biophysics in the chemistry department. And I think that says everything that you need to know about the nature of science these days. I'm also a Wellcome Trust Senior Research Fellow and the Wellcome Trust supports research in, in, into, into, into health. So, um, in my life and my career, I've been extremely multidisciplinary, and I, I think that's why, again, events like this, which make people with different disciplines talk to each other, is actually fundamental to, to academic research and scholarship. So, part of this talk, I, I'm basing part of this talk on a on a talk I on an article I wrote for the chemistry department, and it was called Heroes and Mentors. And I think it's quite important when we consider any career, is that we don't do this on our own. Life is not, we're not in isolation. And so I'm going to talk you through my life, but talking about some of the people who've made all the difference in my life. So let's let's take this walk along my career. Well, 1950, my, my life began. You can work it out. Um, you can do the math, as they say. Um, and what happens is the first thing that you come across is your family. And I want to give credit to my family, and I'm sure lots of you want to give credit for your family, because actually my background was extraordinarily privileged. Um, it wasn't privileged economically. Here's one of my granddads. His 14th birthday party was uh, a packet of cigarettes, he only got 10, uh, and his first day down the mines in the South Wales Valley. Uh, and, and here are the parents of my mother. Um, but what they gave me and what they had was a, was, was a passion for education and for learning. And they would do anything to make sure their children were well educated. And the family sacrificed a lot for, to let my mother, during the war, commute from the valleys daily to Cardiff to do a degree. And I do think that a passion for education and what you do is something I hope you had the privilege of getting from your families. And I hope you'll pass on to the people that come behind you. But in 1950, I would also say that my life as a scientist began because my mother was a scientist and she always encouraged curiosity. 
she always encouraged you to ask questions. It, it got a bit bizarre because every time, you know, if you, you had a leg of lamb, for, you had to look at, or a shoulder of lamb, look at the ball and socket joint and it's different to the knee joint. And there was no trip to the beach that wasn't spoiled by having to go and look at what was in the rock pools instead of playing in the sand. But, but that curiosity and that drive to ask questions, no question was ever stupid, and go out and find the answer was there. And so she was, when I wrote this article, my very first hero. Uh, the sadness is she died just before I started my PhD, so she never saw me here. Um, but, you know, she was my very first hero. So then I went to school. I went to um, a state school here in Cambridge. Um, she, she was a school teacher. Um, and I went to school here in Cambridge. And in 1969, I went to college. I went to York University to study biochemistry. And then when I finished, I became a teacher. Uh, with the Welsh mining background, of course, I had to teach in state schools and in comprehensive schools. And I taught mostly in North London. Uh, I was head of uh, biology and head of science in a school right behind the Spurs football ground. So I'm a Tottenham supporter, um, which is an inheritance you might like or not. Um, and uh, I love teaching. I was enjoying it. Um, I became a mother, and so I started teaching part time. And my my whole ambition was to be a, be a teacher, to be a great teacher. And it make you know teaching. Those of you who've done it will understand. You know, great doing teacher. Those of you who are understanding how rewarding it can be. Um, but then my husband came home one day and he said um, the bank who he worked for want us to go to Atlanta. So we moved to America and I couldn't teach there, um, but I went to Georgia Tech, um, a local university in Atlanta, to do a master's degree to upgrade my science. And that's when I met mentor number two. His name was Bud Suddeth and he was a protein crystallographer. And he introduced me to proteins. Now, I'm not an artist. I don't have an artistic soul in my body. But if you don't think that's beautiful, I'm sorry, but you're missing something. And I'll give me a glass of wine afterwards and I'll explain to you why it's so exquisite. But he taught me to, to love proteins and to love research. And I knew that from that time on, what I wanted to do was investigate the link between gene sequences, you've just heard about those, and protein sequences and protein structures and function. And I knew exactly what I wanted to do. My life had been changed by Bud. And so what do I do? We come back. I live in Saffron Walden, 60 miles south of here. Came back to Cambridge and I applied to do a PhD. Now, I've told you I want to do proteins. I apologise. People have heard this before, but I told you I wanted to work on proteins. As I went to the biochemistry department, I said, here I am. I want to do a PhD. And for the very first time that I can remember in my life, I was told, no, you can't. I was told, no, you're an old woman, you've got too many children. Um, and it's not, I, somebody actually said to me, it's not possible to do a PhD when you've got children. Um, <laughs> but again, the Welsh mining background, so my mum was behind me, she was, she was dead, but she was behind me going, oh yes you can, oh yes you can. Tell them, tell them that you're being useless. Um, but Bud had, again, came into this and he'd given me a letter for Alan First, who was top protein chemist and who was in the chemistry department. So on a, on a cold day, I just knocked on the door in the chemistry department, he was there. I said, this is me and this is what I want to do. And he said, okay, start in October, I'll give you a studentship. And you know, there's something, there is my hero. I mean, without him, that's why he's on this board. Without him, I wouldn't be here today. Well, actually, that's not true. I would have done, because if he'd turned me down, well, Saffron Warden's on the train line to London. There are other universities in other places. And I think this, this is a message that I'll come back to about, you know, don't let people say no to you. If you want to do something, make sure you find somebody who'll say yes. Then my career has become fairly traditional, really. Um, I did a postdoc. I stayed in Cambridge, which is less traditional, but my children were at school, my husband worked there. I needed him to pay the mortgage because I wasn't earning any money. So we stayed in Cambridge. I became a postdoc, and then in 19... 
1997, which I realised is actually 20 years ago, um, I got my first Wellcome Trust Fellowship and I started my research group 20 years ago this year. Um, I've been really fortunate. I have won Wellcome Trust Fellows Fellowships my entire career. So I've never applied for a job in this university. I've just got Wellcome Trust Fellowships that have paid my own salary and my research expenses. And through that time, I have made friends all over the world. Here are some women. Um, and and the, the heroes I chose are women because um, I've actually found in a very male-dominated area of science and chemistry, uh, these women have known and understand, and they've grown up with me. These are actually my closest rivals. These are the people who publish papers, and I go, oh, damn it, I wish I had published that work, because it's so good. But we've grown up together throughout our careers. Uh, Susan Marcusy in Berkeley, Carol Robinson in Oxford, Sheena Radford in Leeds. And although we're rivals, where they've also been my colleagues and mentors throughout my career. In 2010, I was elected Professor of Chemistry in Cambridge. Um, I became a fellow of Trinity Hall, and uh, as Lisa said, in 2013, 2015, I was elected fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences and FRS. And this was just kind of, yeah, uh, if only she'd known. She, yeah. So let's reflect on my career. Um, there are highs and lows in an academic career. Unfortunately, the highs are much better than the lows. But, you know, I mean, if I'm going to talk to young people about careers, I'm not going to tell you it's all daisies and things. Um, I love being a research scientist. I love being a teacher. I never thought of giving it up, but I love this even more. And you know what? Life is far too short to do something you don't enjoy doing. If you don't like doing it, stop doing it. Go and find something else you do like doing. Really, life's too short. I spend all day, every day, with some of the brightest young people in this country. I have to tell you, if you're not a scientist, you are missing out, because science is such, it's such a collaborative thing. That's who I spend my days with. You know, I'm 67 years old, if you couldn't do the math, and um, I spend all the time with people under 35. Academia is actually a great job to combine with parenthood. When I was a teacher and my daughter was third angel on the right in the nativity play, I couldn't go and see her. But once I became an academic, I had a flexible lifestyle so I could mix and match time. If the kids were sick, I could stay off, not leave them at home sick, which I did when I was a school teacher, and go to work in the evenings when my husband came home, or at the weekends, or work from home. You find friends and mentors all over the world, and I've learned to cherish them, nurture them, and support them back. And they are some of my best friends. And a supportive family is really important. Choose your partner in life very carefully. Choose a banker if you can, uh, which is what I did, but even so, but you know, you need to find somebody who's prepared to support you through this. Um, uh, and, and, and you know, people that are prepared to, to accept that. What have the challenges been? Well, there are several. Uncertainty in my career path. I told you I've never held a proper job. So every five years, I've had to go back to the Wellcome Trust for funding. Every five years, my job was on the line and the job for, the, for my postdocs and, uh, and research assistants in my lab. It's a bit tough. Rejection. <laughs> if you're an academic, you know how rejection feels. Um, you've got to get used to it. And you've got to be res resilient. I started off being rejected, as I told you. So, you know, but your papers get turned down. Your grants get rejected. Um, you've got to learn to deal with that and be strong enough. But know it's there. Prepare yourself for it. Ambition. This is a tricky one. Um, one, of my, one of my friends in, in, uh, in, the, in the clinical school, her head of department said to her the other day, said, you know your trouble it's called her Susan. Her name isn't Susan. You know your trouble, Susan, is you're too ambitious. And she said, you know, nobody would say that to a man. You're too ambitious. 
you know, I'm ambitious, not necessarily personally ambitious, but I want pe I want to do the best work there is in the world. And if I don't, I shouldn't be here. I want my students to get the best things that they can from being in my group. And if they don't, then I'm not being ambitious enough. Loneliness, you've got to, you've got to deal with that. In my department, you know, there are still very few women in my department. Um, and, men, and very few of them, I started late, so my equivalents were all going to the pub and things, and I was not. Um, and, and it can be lonely, which is why it's nice spending all day with these 35-year-olds. Guilt. <laughs> Why aren't you a proper mummy, mummy? Well, I, I thought I was. Well, Debbie makes cake. Um, yeah, you've got to actually start accepting that actually being a good enough mother, a good enough daughter, good enough wife, it's okay. You, know, you can't be perfect. We read about the super mums that we read about. Well, you know, I think they're very, they're very rare. I'm not. I'm good enough. And so getting that life work balance life can be can be a bit tricky. And actually, also, I've learned you can't have everything. You can't be the best mum, the mum that make you you're, you can't be the mum whose child wins the fancy dress competition and be a research scientist. You're never going to be able to do everything. Um, and so what you've got to do is think about your priorities and then adjust your way of life and work to match those priorities. So I have kept my research group small deliberately my entire career. I've not got one of these great big teams and forged huge things and got hundreds of papers and gone vastly fast through my career. I've done reasonably fast, but not vastly fast, because there have been other things that have been important in my life. And it's okay to have different priorities. It's okay to challenge the norm or come back to that and say, no, actually, this is the way I want to do it. It's okay to say to people, uh, yeah, Alan Fersh never, ever, ever, ever once said to me when I left the lab at 4.30, where are you going? What time do you think this is? He only ever looked at the quality of what I produced. Let's look at what you produce. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. I've had a small group, but so many of my papers, all my best papers, are results of collaborations with those friends and those colleagues that I've made across the globe. Learn how and when to say no. There's an art. Support your group and your colleagues, and actually, do you know what? They support you back. My daughter was very ill um, for a while, about six or seven years ago, and I had to go and stay with her for several week periods in that time, my research output went up because my group were there giving me the support I needed. Well, that's what I like to think. Maybe it was because I wasn't there interfering, but um, I like to think it was because they, they cared enough to make sure that they were supporting me because I'd supported them in the past. Challenge the norm. There is more than one way to have a successful scientific career. And you know what? Determination gets you an awful long way. So, here's a milestone. Looks like a gravestone. Uh, 2017 retirement. You probably know that the University of Cambridge voted for uh, to keep the retirement age. I voted for it. I voted for it because, well, I'll explain. Maybe you'll see why I voted for it. But I think that... We need, why am I working with these brilliant young people if I then don't want to stop and step aside and let them have a chance? <laughs> but if you're an experimental scientist voting for retirement, it's like a turkey voting for Christmas because you're voting for yourself not to be able to do the experimental science that you've been doing for. And when I wrote this here as a mentors thing, I thought I put another person, this is my last hero or mentor, and this is, I'd like to introduce you to Martha. Martha's my granddaughter. She's a bit dark there, but she's got a bit grim face here. Uh, this is Martha. So why on earth would I put Martha as my final hero and mentor? Well, here's another reflection on my career. And the reflection on my career was, where are all the women? 
When I went to York in 1969, this was the time of women's liberation. I knew things had changed. I knew that this was fine. We'd broken that through that ceiling. It was great. Women now could do anything. And there had been about, of about the 20 lecturers in York, uh, two of them were women when I went there. Two, actually, three of them were women when I went there. When I went back to chemistry in 1967, there were three women out of 50-something, and there had never, ever, ever been a woman professor of chemistry. Right? And even now, although things are a little bit better, we still fail to recruit and retain talented women in, in equal or even sufficient numbers at both student and academic levels. Across the university as a whole, women are underrepresented among those obtaining first class degrees. Did you know that? And women fail to be promoted to senior or you know, level posts. So the question is, where are the role models our talented young women deserve? Now I want to break off here because when I talk about role models and, and you talk about role models, there's a real danger. There's a real danger of somebody like me who's had a successful career talking to people like you and you say, oh, hasn't she done well? She's exceptional. Uh, and you're right, I am exceptional. But then I went and looked up what exceptional meant. Let me, let me, did this, piece of paper. Because I am exceptional, but I don't mean I'm exceptional as in meaning I'm unusually excellent or superior. You guys are at Oxbridge. Oxbridge, look, Oxford, Cambridge. You are all exceptional by absolute, complete, that definition, everybody sitting in this room is exceptional. Okay? So let's cross that meaning off. Exceptional means uh, something that's rare. Well, of course I'm rare. <laughs> there aren't that many women professors, you know, in, in chemistry. But it doesn't mean to say that it's unobtainable. It just means that we want to make sure that there's the opportunities. And it's not just women. Just look at what we have seen here, the talent we've seen up on this stage here in terms of not just gender but ethnic diversity and things. And now go back and look at the professors in Cambridge chemistry. Right? So where are the mold models we deserve? And we shouldn't take them from you know, the great people. Let me tell you a story about a role model I'd like to bring to you today. And this is a story about determination. Now, in my lab, I've got a big lab, and we have a cleaner, cleaner technician. And this person comes, works for half a day, and she cleans the lab, and she makes the media, and she cares for the instruments, and so forth. And Anita went on um, maternity leave, and so we advertised, and I had nothing to do with it. Uh, the department uh, um, brought in a young woman from Brazil, um, to, to to be our cleaner and she was working part-time and um, you know, I said hello how are you very nice to see you thank you for doing things um, and she was very friendly and talked to lots of people in my group and things like this and one day I saw this 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 young woman sitting while she was waiting for some media to to boil up um, uh, reading one of my papers and I said, oh, you're reading a paper. You know, I mean, you know, me, what am, I, what am I thinking? I didn't think a cleaner would read a paper. You know, this is the sort of prejudice I had. And it turned out that she was a chemist. She'd done a degree in chemistry. And she was here because her, her husband um, was doing a PhD. And she um, was wanted to get back into doing chemistry. But her degree had not been very good and she couldn't find a chemistry job. So she'd applied for this cleaning job so she could be in a chemistry department working with chemists. But that was her ambition. Um, and, it turned, uh, and it turned out that her degree hadn't been very good, not because she wasn't very good, because she'd been a carer while she'd been doing her degree. And so, you know, she'd been doing courses and had to drop them and, and spend time. So I said to her, well, do you know what? You know, you could get at least get, I can't give you a job, but if you, you're only working half time, if you'd like to sort of do some little lab work, because getting a bit of experience in a lab might help you get a job maybe in one of the local firms, 
because you've got some lab experience. So she started working in the lab in her afternoons. And then when Anita came back, she stayed working in the lab all the time. And she was a very determined young woman. And she got a grant from the Brazilian government to do graduate studies. This is, what she, this is where she is now. You might recognise her as the girl who's not going to ring the bell because I'm running over, because she's in my lab and I'm her supervisor, so she won't. Um, but she is now, she got an MPhil. She's now a PhD student in the lab. This is her first paper in PNAS, one of the top scientific journals there are. I would present her to you as a role model. And the point about role models is you need to show people who are completely determined that if things get you down, you need to actually try and you can do it. Sorry, I'm embarrassing. <laughs> So in the eye reflections, I think about all these talented young people we bring in, and, we, and we've got this metaphor, don't we have a, a, a leaky pipe? We bring in talented young people of completely diverse backgrounds, and then they leak out. And the question is, why do they leak out? And you'll hear all the time things like, women should. Women should be stronger. Women should, you know, women shouldn't expect to have good careers if they want to be parents. Women should this, this, and this. And there's a great article called this, which is by a woman called Frances Hocutt, who was an organic chemist and left because she hated it so much. And she says this, she said, when a pipeline leaks, we don't blame the water. We fix the pipe and we design the leak the next one to leak less. So why do we blame women who leave the STEM fields? Why do we not blame academic institutions for not being places where every people of every type can thrive? So what am I going to do in my retirement? How I do it is not yet clear, but to support the next generation, because there's still work to be done. And you know what? We can't just wait for things to improve. I went to, went to university in 1969. It's now 2017. And as far as I can see, things are not materially, certainly not sufficiently better. We've got to actively work to change the way we behave and to change our institutions so that everybody can thrive and see value in diversity. That means stop thinking success looks like us. Success looks like the young people that have sat in this audience today. And what we old guard have to do is to make sure that the institutions that we have an influence over can help the young people like you thrive. And it's important. Why is it important? Well, it's important for Martha. It's important for her brother and her cousins. Here's my scientific children. Uh, <laughs> experimenting in the pond and Henry is encouraging his sister to drink the pond water to see what it tastes like <laughs> and it's important for if I can make this go sorry all the rest of the next generation of scientists and researchers those people that make my life a joy to go to work every day and for everybody here who's given me a great afternoon. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Richard to give it to Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jane. Um. <laughs> that's for Jane, right? Yes, it's for Jane. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, wish it's you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.